Hello, my name is Daniel and I work at the Chartist Institute of Fundraising. As part of National Storytelling Week, I've been working with colleagues to share, gather, publish stories from across our membership of fundraisers, talking about what they do, why they do it, the difference that it makes uh, and what it feels like to be to be a fundraiser. It's been an amazing project to be part of um, and it's great to be sharing and showcasing um, the, the professional fundraising and the, the passion and professionalism of, of individual fundraisers. Um, but as part of that project, uh, part of the research that I was doing for it, I came across uh, something which actually really struck home for me because it brought to life a personal connection with fundraising, which I hadn't quite tweaked was there. Um, and I just wanted to share that as part of National Storytelling Week as well. Um, goes back a bit in time. So in 1939, Duke of Gloucester's Red Cross and St John's Peel started a fundraising appeal to support people affected by the Second World War. Um, between 1939 and 1946, it raised £54 million, which sounds a lot of money now. Um, it was an even bigger amount of money then. Uh, in today's terms, that's worth £7.7 .7 billion. Pounds, and it was collected through house to house, um, donations that people made through their weekly wages and uh, uh, popularising charity shops. Um, there's a great um, case study on the showcase of fundraising innovation and inspiration site to find out more about that appeal. Um, so probably the most successful fundraising appeal ever. Um, and that money that was raised through that appeal uh, meant that on the 21st of April 1945, five British Red Cross teams were able to go with doctors, nurses, medical supplies, food into the Belson concentration camp. Um, it's about five, six days after British troops had liberated uh, the camp um, and the British Red Cross teams went in there to care uh, and try to uh, nurse and support people who they found that were still alive in that concentration camp. And one of the people that they found that was still alive, one of the inmates, um, was my grandmother, Esther Brunstein. Uh, she wasn't actually um, really kind of conscious at the point of the camp being liberated. She had typhus, she was really ill. Um, but she always talked about her um, memory of kind of coming around, becoming conscious, being aware of what was going on. Next to her bed, there being a can of condensed milk and a slice of black bread. And she knew at that point something had changed, something was different, and what was in front of her was like to save her life. Um, and I had never quite realised that the provision of the care, um, nursing care, the doctors, the medical support, the food, and then the refugee camps that she went that she she went to afterwards, what saved her life at that time um, was I always had kind of assumed it was the army, it was the state. Actually, through seeing these cases, seeing that, I've actually realised it was most likely that it was because fundraisers came together to put an appeal together, starting in 1939 going house to house, asking for money, and that the great British public responded with kindness and generosity to that appeal. And that that's the thing that's very likely um, saved her life um, in 1945. Um, and that story has an, has an ongoing resonance as well, uh, because she then went on to tell her story um, to at the UN, to schools, um, at museums, uh, to, to BBC News and so on, um, at various points of Holocaust um, commemoration and memorial, talking about the importance of memories of stories, of remembering what happened and anti-racism work. And one of the people that she met in, in this, in, in, a, in a BBC studio actually, uh, was Neville Lawrence, uh, the father of Stephen Lawrence, the um, who was murdered um, through um, racist gang violence uh, in London. Um, and in, in, in an interview in 2021, sorry, in 2012, uh, Neville Lawrence talked about, or he was asked about how do you get through it? How do you recover from something like that? What inspired you to go on and make a difference and, and to share your story and talk? And he talked about meeting an elderly Jewish lady uh, in a BBC studio who could talk about how she could recover from that trauma that, that she had from losing nearly all of her family um, through being in a concentration camp, through being displaced. And she said to him, you've got to let it out. You've got to tell your story. 
inspire others through what you've experienced. And that meant that Neville Lawrence then felt he should go out to schools, um, to youth clubs and talk about anti-racism work and, um, and equality and racial justice. And I was just kind of putting that together, that almost a hundred years um, kind of spanning uh, a fundraising appeal, generosity of the public, people that benefit from that, and then the difference that that makes echoing over time, repeating over time through people sharing stories, um, inspiring others, talking about the work that they do and why it's so important. All of which for me, coming back to the fact that in 1939, there was a fundraiser there, group of fundraisers going house to house, setting up charity shops, asking people to give. And the ongoing benefits of that still being felt today. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I am proud to be part of a body which represents and champions fundraisers, who you are, what you do, because never doubt that it makes a massive difference and probably an ongoing difference reaching people and communities who you would never expect through the work that you're doing. So thank you to all the fundraisers that are doing an absolutely amazing job out there. Um, and the stories that you get, the stories that we share, um, always will bring it home about your passion, your professionalism and the difference that it makes.